Today's lecture is going to be over chapter 16, section 1. Section 1 objectives, summarize the history of Russia. Number 2, explain how the former Soviet command economy worked. Number 3, describe the cultural backgrounds and achievements of Russia and the Western Republics. Number 4, describe ways in which Russia life has changed and remained the same. So the first thing that we're going to look at is we're going to look at kind of where uh, we're talking about on the map. Now, one thing we want to look at, and we see Russia being a very, very large country, which it definitely is a large country. But one thing we got to know is, is that if you, when you start looking at these maps, the maps, again, when they start getting near the poles, when you start getting way, way up north, you're going to start seeing the countries getting kind of stretched out a little bit. If you look at this map compared to the map in the back of the room, what you're going to see is, is that this map shows it being Russia being a little bit smaller. Um, when in fact, Russia, if you look at, uh, we pull Greenland up here, Greenland is completely stretched out here because, again, of the map projections and the fact that you can't make a round object fly without creating distortion. So when we look at Russia, we can see that it's really stretched out and it's bigger than what it actually appears. If we look at just a straight up satellite image of Russia, and again, what we're going to kind of look at is we're going to look at countries. There we go. We're going to kind of start looking at some countries. Um, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, what we're going to see is, is that this area is actually relatively green in some areas. And then what we look at is, is that on the map, we can see that when we really start getting to the east side over here, um, Siberia, places like that, it's a little bit different, a little bit harder to, uh, for things to grow and so on and so forth. But again, Russia and its neighbors, expansion adds variety of people, culture, languages, regions, very, very big area. What we see is that this country is going, or this area is going to go ahead and include Belarus, Moldova, Ukraine to the west. You see the Baltic Republics, which is Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, are going to go ahead and be kind of known for the, in this area. The ninth, 19, or excuse me, the ninth century Vikings are going to settle near Kiev, and they're going to adopt the Slavic customs. The settlement expands between the Baltic and the Black Seas, and pretty soon you're going to start seeing this group kind of become um, kind of a similar culture. In the 1200s, Mongol warriors known as the Tatars are going to invade and sack Kiev, and the Tatars control the area until Ivan the Great expels them in 1500. So we talked about Mongolia earlier on, and we've talked about how they kind of have interacted with Russia, how they have also um, conquered places like China. You're going to see them doing the same thing here. Russia expands to the east until the empire reaches the Pacific Ocean by the 1700s. Now one of the things that's kind of interesting about this, and we'll kind of zoom out on the map right here, is that Russia continues to go and settle to the east. And what actually happens is, is that near the end of the 1700s, what we actually see is, is that the Russian Empire continues to spread, and it's going to spread all up into Alaska, down Canada and almost all the way, or I should say down into the United States. And what we see is, is that the Monroe Doctrine um, in the early 1800s is actually going to be aimed at stopping Russia from coming down into this area. A lot of people think that the Monroe Doctrine, and again, that's basically trying to eliminate people in Europe to settle or I should say start new settlements in Central and South America, a lot of people think that that's what it was aimed at, which in fact it was actually Russia coming down into as far as into the United States and obviously um, it wasn't the United States at that time uh, but what we are going to see is we are going to see them kind of going into California where we, they, people start to get a little bit worried that they're going to continue on into the United States at that time. Now you're going to see Russia is going to lag behind the Western Europe. Rapid territorial growth is not matched by technological advancements, and it's going to be very, very hard. They're going to get a large amount of area, but what they do is they stay kind of um, away from the technological improvements. We're going to see the rulers or the emperor is going to be called the Tsar, and the Tsar Peter the Great is going to modernize Russia. Now, Peter the Great is not the only Tsar, but during his time, that's what they called their rulers. What they're going to do is that they're going to move Moscow to St. Petersburg on the Baltic Sea. Now, you might ask, why are, why would they possibly do this? What we see is, is that if we kind of come back to the map um, of what we see here, you're going to go ahead and you're going to see Moscow, which is inland, and then you're going to see St. Petersburg, that's right on the Baltic Sea. 
if you've got your capital in Moscow, what's going to happen is is that it's really going to be uh, a little bit more difficult to be getting onto the water. Um, transportation is less likely. Um, trade is a little bit harder. And so what we see is is that at this time Russia is going to move their capital to St. Petersburg. And then what we see is is that they're going to be able to have access to the Baltic Sea, which gives them access to the North Sea, which of course gives them access to the Atlantic Ocean. So all of this happens primarily because we're going to go ahead and we're going to see them move the the capital to St. Petersburg and it kind of tries to modernize things they call it the window to the west but the issue is is that Russia is actually so slow to industrialize they're going to control Europe by half a century and eventually the industrialization is going to bring harsh working conditions low wages people's unrest grow and people get mad one of the things that we usually see when we start looking at economics is that when people start having trouble paying the bills they're going to get unhappy and they're going to get upset and this is exactly what happens in russia now you probably heard about this story when you guys started studying your american history but what we see is is that we see it in the 1917 the russian revolution is going to start and what this is is that this is the overtaking of the czars we talked about the czars being the ruler and um, basically in charge in russia but what we see is that this is where the communist party takes over uh, vladimir lenin is going to be the communist ruler um, he's going to go ahead and he's going to take over and he is going to control the government and the uh, economics and so what we see is, is that the communist party is going to become very organized it's going to go ahead and it's going to um, form what we know as the Uni union of the soviet socialist republics or the Soviet Union. One thing um, people that are kind of older like me, we call Russia the Soviet Union just out of habit. We really shouldn't do that because they are Russia now because of course the Soviet Union is going to falter in about 1992. But going back a little bit here joseph stalin is going to take over the soviet union and what happens is, is that he is going to lead them during the time of world war ii now what's interesting about this is is that the united states actually fights on the side of the soviet union and a lot of people say you know why in the world would we ever do that and of course the biggest thing is, is that we wanted to defeat hitler and the Soviet Union is going to want to defeat Hitler eventually. And what we do is we start to kind of sign treaties together. One thing that happens kind of during this time is that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union were supposed to try and help us when we bombed or when Pearl Harbor was bombed and we went into. Um, defeat Japan but they did not help us and that's going to cause some tensions after again World War II. Um, after the war the pro-Soviet government is stalled in Eastern Europe and they're going to continue to spread. One of the things that Harry Truman said when he left office is he said that the Soviet Union would collapse eventually because they were not or they're not able to continue growing without taking over countries and eventually their empire would become too big and they wouldn't be able to control it and that's a essentially what happened with the domino effect in 1989. Now, in 1940, tensions are going to grow between the United States and the communist expansion. What we see is the Cold War happens right after World War II, and again, it's going to end in the early 1990s. The United States Soviets, this is a conflict that never had open war. Technically, no one died on the battlefield during this Cold War. But what happens is, is that there's so much fighting, there's so much bickering, there's so many people that don't like each other. Um, this is where, if you remember uh, reading about or studying about the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, Vietnam War, Korean War, these were all part of the Cold War where the United States said we are not going to allow the spread of communism, and that's of course the Truman Doctrine. Now, 1980s, you got a guy by the name of Mikhail Gorbachev. He's going to go ahead and he's going to be the ruler. And what's happening in the Soviet Union is things are not going well. Things are starting to slow down. They're not expanding so much anymore and so they're not able to get resources um, and things are starting to collapse and so what happens is Gorbachev is going to go ahead and he's going to push more economic and political freedom 
One thing to understand about when we talk about capitalism and communism, a lot of people think it's just cut and dry. You're either capitalist or you're a, or a communist. And that's really not true. Usually there's kind of a variation of it. So for example, in the United States, everybody thinks we're very capitalist. But in fact, we do have a little form of communism. In, and what I mean by that is, is that the government can control economics. Uh, an example in the United States is if you've ever played the game Monopoly, Monopoly is illegal legal in the United States. You cannot have a monopoly, meaning you cannot be the only business um, to sell things. And the United States has stopped in, and that's of course with Teddy Roosevelt. He is the trust breaker. And what he's going to do is he's going to stop the big businesses from basically having monopolies. Guys like Andrew Carnegie and J.D. Rockefeller. But again, what happens is, is that the United States is really capitalist, but there are very small kind of items that the government is controlling um, the gov or the economics. So what we see is, is that at this time with Mikhail Gorbachev, he's going to lessen the um, government-run industries in the Soviet Union and kind of bit by bit after 1989 you start seeing countries leaving the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union can't do anything about it and this of course is going to be the end of the Cold War because in 1991-1992 this is when the Soviet Union collapses. Now the region is going to be divided into 15 interdependent countries, uh, republics. Russia is the largest, most powerful. It has a popular elected president and a two-chamber federal assembly. Now, in 1917, we kind of go back here a little bit, and this is kind of where what how does this kind of command economy develop? A guy by the name of Karl Marx. This is uh, the kind of grandfather of communism. He's a German philosopher and he really believes that capitalism is doomed because he believes that there are too uh, few wealthy people and there's too many poor people. And he believes that the wealthy are basically controlling the poor people, making sure that they stay poor while the wealthy continue to be richer and richer. Um, he predicts that communism, a shared property of wealth, will replace it. Now, what we see is, is that the Soviets eventually are going to adopt what's known as a command economy. The definition of a command economy is the central government makes major economic decisions. They control the wealth, meaning they control the money. They control the land, the mines, the factories, banks, transportation. The, the biggest thing about command economy is they decide what products are going to be produced and they set the prices. For example, we, we've talked about this before in class. We've said that the United States, we set the prices. If you go in and you buy a $100 shirt, you are showing that company that you'll pay that money and they will go ahead and they will continue to raise the prices. If you don't buy something in the United States, eventually the prices will drop in the form of sales. And so what we see in the command economy is that's not the case. If they put a dollar for a loaf of bread, the people have to charge that dollar. And if they don't, they can get in big time trouble. Kind of the kind of same notion that the people are going to go ahead and if they are going to buy the bread, they have to buy it at that price. So the price is kind of determined by the government and not the people. Now, the Soviet Union increases industrialization and farming during the um, later 1900s, and they see something that's known as collective farms. These are large teams of laborers that gather together and they work. Thousands are going to move to these farms by 1939, and you're going to see that 90% of the farms are actually going to be collective farms. This is important because the people don't necessarily run them. It's more of a group, and the government is supposed to kind of be the big brother to this. Now, what actually happens? in a command economy is that millions of people are going to starve in famines because of these collective farms. They're not able to make money and they're essentially kind of um, become third, fourth class citizens, if you will. In reality, few individuals benefit from these economic changes and instead of the uh, few rich and the um, large group of poor people, it just kind of exacerbates this and makes it so that there is a lot of poor people more than before and fewer rich people. Stalin is going to police um, any protesters that do this. And Joseph Stalin is said to have caused 14 million deaths. What's interesting about this is, is that Adolf Hitler is about uh, considered to be about 6 million deaths. And the question is, is that we consider Adolf Hitler to be one of the worst, worst people in the world, but Joseph Stalin, people don't really put that, him into the category. And really, here's the reason why. Um, Adolf Hitler killed those people, and he killed them because 
because they were different and they were not of the Aryan race that he was pushing. Stalin is pushing this uh, and killing people because he wants to promote his own country. Now, obviously, it's horrible to kill that many people, but we don't consider him to be the monster that um, that um, Adolf Hitler was simply because he's trying to promote his country. Again, it's not probably fair, but that's the reason why. 1990, Russia tries to put economic control back into the private hands, and you're going to go ahead and you're going to see um, kind of the changing of the guard where you start getting capitalism in Russia. Now, uh, ethni ethnicity and religion, rich variety of ethnic groups due to centuries of expansion. Russia has a great diversity. 80% are going to be Russian. Um, 70 other p types of people live in Russia, Finnish, Turkish, Mongolian. Most Russians are going to be Orthodox Christian that's going to be adopted in the 19 or 900s, but they're going to be persecuted because many Jews immigrate uh, to Israel and to the United States. So the Jewish people are going to have to be kind of um, pushed out by this persecution. Now we go ahead and we uh, see the different types of artistic stuff that's going on during this period of time, um, and what we see is the Soviet Union. And I, I, the best way that I can explain this is uh, the Soviet Union has really got these big buildings. Um, they almost look kind of like a bounce house. Um, but what they're going to do is they're going to have a very distinct architecture during this period of time. Um, they are going to be very, very good in a lot of different things. Um, I remember one time a professor told me that the Soviet Union. Had had three things better than anybody else for a time being. One was a space race, one's going to be ballet, and one's going to be hockey. And they took a lot of pride on that. And so what you saw was, was that you see um, the idea that the Communist Party is going to dictate this style and they want to be good at this stuff. Um, if you ever get a chance to watch a movie, it's called Miracle. It basically involves the Soviet Union versus the United States. And it kind of talks about some of these issues right here. Now what we eventually see is is that the Soviet Union collapses and they're going to go ahead and they're going to be a little bit more open to outside influence, things like the United States' culture. Um, you're going to see more cultural and social opportunities in Moscow, St. Petersburg. You're going to see books, periodicals, movies, music, clothing, international foods. Now you might sit there and say, well, what's the big deal about all that stuff? Well, during the communist time, they didn't want uprisings, they didn't want revolts, and so what you see is, is that they actually say, you cannot read this, you cannot go to this play, you can't look at this, and so being able to kind of experience these things started to open the eyes of the people of Russia. You are going to go ahead and you're going to see native traditions of kind of the food around there, rye bread, kasha, um, vodka, those are going to be things that are going to be grown in Russia um, that they become very accustomed to. Last but not least, and the last slide is going to go ahead and it's going to talk about um, some of the traditions that are going around today. Um, only about one-fourth of Russia's live in rural, um, but the countryside is very, very uh, cherished. You're going to see that about 30% of the people are going to spend their weekends um, in kind of their country homes, small plain houses, often with vegetable gardens. And they're going to see bayas are going to be bathhouses that are very kind of common in here, 200 degree saunas. Um, and basically what you see is is that this kind of all develops around the colder temperatures. They do do something that's a plunge into the icy cold water and then they'll follow by drinking hot tea, something that usually people don't do around the United States, but that's going to be kind of a common um, cultural heritage in Russia because, again, of the colder temperatures. That concludes our lecture for today. Please make sure that you complete the assessment at this time.